Everybody, long time no talk. It's good to be back with you here on the Three Technique, a college football podcast at the intersection of the X's and O's and the Jimmy's and the Joe's. Uh, I think uh, maybe the rumors of my demise perhaps were exaggerated. Maybe they were celebrated. Um, back from my honeymoon. Glad to be back with you, Trey Reeves, Garrett Turney, here with you as well. And fellas, um, first of all, y'all did an immaculate job holding down the fort while I was sipping cocktails on a beach um i really enjoyed listening to the episodes y'all did a phenomenal job um breaking down uh spoilers was was the last episode y'all did mailbag episodes so first of all just a a great thanks to y'all but i'm back in time for our darlings episode and then we've got previews right around the corner which i mean uh, you can almost taste football season yeah, it almost doesn't get better than this. The only thing better is when we actually have games on the field. It is great yep. to have you back, Mitch. We we held it together, but anytime that it's just the two of us, things can get a little crazy. I promised two teams on an episode when you weren't here, and we didn't even get to them. So it, <laughs> it, you're a master host, my friend, and we're, we're blessed to have you back. Yeah, one time in the uh, chat, the little private backstage chat, we literally sent back and forth, we need Mitch like we need air. And and so we are we are glad that you are back helping us out, but we uh we need you. We're glad you had your chance to go have your fun and all that. But you know, come on, get back. We need you. We did Jan almost uh, everywhere and having a good time down there. Yeah, yeah, Jan almost everywhere. Not 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 my wife's <laughs> name, but we did we did quote that yes. many many times. We we oh yeah, there there was a steel drum playing at one one night while we were uh, eating dinner out on the beach, and uh, we were definitely doing the Michael Michael Scott. Yeah. Hot, hot, hot. Hot, yep. Exactly. So, uh, yeah, no, ton of fun. Great, great time. I, I told Anna Rose today, um, I'm just not sure what to do with myself now that someone's not bringing me chicken bites or a steak wrap at 2 o'clock in the afternoon because... He's not just hungry. bringing you chicken bites in the afternoon? No, I know. Um, need to need to figure that out here at, uh, <laughs> at the old homestead. But no, it's great to be back. I, I'm just so pumped. I, I got <clears throat> kind of antsy towards the end of the, the honeymoon. I was like, I don't I, I don't know what to do with my hands. Like I want to be doing productive things with with college football again. So uh, anyway, it's it's great to be back. We've got a fun episode for you guys tonight. The Darlings episode that uh, is in its third installation. We've done this all three years that we've been a show, and I think it keeps getting bigger and better every single year. You guys let us know how our darlings are doing over on Twitter, which is a great time to plug that because boy, we are growing something fierce. Uh, Almost a thousand followers over on Twitter. If you wouldn't mind hitting that follow button, if you're new at three tech pod, you can find us on all our social media as well as podcasting platforms and over on YouTube. We'd love to have you be a part of the journey as we just continue to grow this again. Year three for us. We've gotten better each and every season that we've done this, and we've got even bigger, better previews planned. Um, We've had folks asking in the comments, hey, are y'all doing the live streams on Saturday nights after games? We absolutely are. So a lot of content coming out. Plus, we launched our Substack not too long ago. Free 99, you get all the articles you want. If you're looking for free previews with you know really solid research, uh, we've got those over on our Substack right now. We're finishing up the ACC this week. We'll have Group of Five and Notre Dame content coming as well guys uh just a quick shout out to our uh, phenomenal sponsor home field apparel the good brand we just gave away our home field 150 dollars gift card trey you installed a second prize while i was off on the beaches of of florida um you've given away that prize as well so just uh extra incentive to subscribe to the show be a jimmy and joe follow along with us we'll be doing more gives away giveaways as we uh as we go throughout the rest of the regular season but with that it's five minutes in. Let's go ahead and get to tonight's episode. Now, gentlemen, Trey, actually, I believe this was your idea back in the day, way back three years ago. 
explain to the people who might be new, which there are a lot of them, if uh, our metrics are correct, explain what the concept of a darling is and kind of what the overall goal of picking them is. A darling is a team that's not nationally a favorite to win it all, right? It's, it's not going to be the teams you find at the top of the odds boards for the national championship. They've got, they're going to be an underdog to make even a 12-team college football playoff. And we like to find teams in the range of five and a half. We've dipped all the way down to like two and a half, three and a half in the over-under sure. wins a little before. For this segment this year, we're sticking in the five and a half to seven and a half range. It's teams that we think just nationally college football is a little bit lower on. And we personally are willing to go to bat for them, maybe against the wills of the other two guys on this show. Sometimes we're in agreement. There's a lot of teams on that we're going to talk about tonight that I think we at least two of us agree on. But for the most part, it's teams that us personally, we've just decided to go to bat for them. They're our darling. We're going to root for them to hit their over this year and have a successful season. Even if it doesn't mean the playoff, it could be just, you know, winning eight or nine games when no one really expected them to do that. Yeah, exactly. I mean, it's not, I think in year one, we had a point system and I don't know, we, we may still have a point system. It's kind of like whose line is it anyway, uh, at times around this show, but, uh, We've had big swings and grand slams hit with teams. I mean, Garrett, I think you took Maryland back in year one, I believe. I took them uh, last year. Was it last year? I took them uh, last well, year. You I, did I went three for three in my first year with, I think it was like Utah, Kansas State, and like, Duke. I, I can't remember the other team, but there's like some Duke. team. It was a Duke. Yeah, yeah Duke ended up winning right. like nine games or something like that. So I just like smashed it on year one. Last year yeah. with Maryland, I might want to, uh, not talk about that as much, but you know, we'll, we'll, we'll get past that Talia, you know, he can't hurt us anymore. So it's, that's what it is. I have our inaugural darling darlings. If you guys would like to. Yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. I would, yeah. Okay. Bring those up. Well, I said that now Instagram is taking forever to load, but I do know Garrett <laughs> had Duke that first year and it was a yeah. fantastic pick. Wasn't there got, over under like two and a half or something? Yeah, It, it was low down yeah. there and uh, yeah. And you nailed it and they went to a bowl game. So stalling here live radio but pulling it up our first <laughs> ever darlings mitch you had nc state over under eight and a half i don't remember if that hit honestly the i don't of, think it did but it was close <laughs> the birth <laughs> of Knowles coin uh, yes, was, that was right. at florida state over six and a half and i think they won nine or ten games in 20 yep, cash that and then texas tech you took a took a flyer on them at your last one we made us take someone that was not predicted to make a bowl game in that first year. You took Texas Tech. They made a bowl game and won that bowl game. And won Stolten. that bowl game. Garrett, yeah. you took Utah, I think, to make the playoff at an over-under of nine. They fell just short of that. but I, I, think I, they, I did take that, yes. They pushed their over-under in the regular season. They won their uh, conference that year. They just they won their play. conference, but not nine regular season wins. They got their 10th in the, in the championship game. Yeah, you, you, I'm giving you the praise for Duke. Give, give me just it a happened. second. Like, I got there. Mentality. Conference championship game has to give you something. You hit Kansas State. You did get points for making the conference championship game. Kansas State hit at over under six and a half, and Duke obviously smashed their over. I think they won eight games when their over under was three and a half. We don't have to talk about mine. Um, <laughs> uh, I had Washington State. They hit their over. Minnesota. I think hit on like the last week of the season at a seven and a half, but I did think that they were going to win the West that year. Mm, um, that's right. And then uh, my last one in 2022 was Texas A&M. We don't have to talk about that one. And something uh, else happened that season that I can't yeah. remember, but oh well. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that was, that was a tough one. Uh, last year, did I have, I, I don't remember who we had last year, who I had last year, at least. Um, I know I predicted Georgia Tech and Virginia Tech to make bowl games, but I don't remember if either of them were my darlings. Uh, I cashed Texas Tech the first year. Trey, you were trying to ride the Red Raiders all the way to Arlington last year. <laughs> maybe, maybe that happens this year. I don't know. But uh, the Joey Mack machine just couldn't win on the road last year. That really hurt you. you. Saying, Joey Mack is apparently on the hot seat according to some people, like in the preview what? magazines I'm reading. No. That's the national perception. I just want to set the record straight. That That is not true. No. Is not the true. Red Raiders could not be happier with Joey McGuire. That's not even close to true. Yeah. I mean, yeah, sure, they want him to win, but anyway. Uh, all right. Well, I think that's enough reliving in the past. Wins, losses, somewhere in between. Guys, let's get into our 2024 
darlings for this season. And uh, you know what? I'm gonna I'm gonna lead us off here. I'm, I've been been itching to get get behind the mic again. We're gonna go with Maryland. They're a repeat offender here on this list. Uh, I wrote some content out on Twitter that blew up. Uh, if you were paying attention, um, upsets to watch. And I did two different tweets uh, while I was gone in Florida. And the first one blew up for all the wrong reasons. I could have sworn, guys, that the Twitter sphere was going to hate me for picking Maryland to beat USC in October. I believe it's October 19th. USC has to come to College Park. Instead, that tweet got praised or picked apart for the other three games in it. Uh, <laughs> but no one really paid attention to this one, which I thought was hilarious. Maryland has an over-under of six and a half. At least when when I picked them, it did. Maybe when you're listening to this podcast, the line has moved. If it's gone up, I think there are some smart betters hitting the market. Because Maryland, while they've lost to Leah Tungavailoa, have gained a rising star in MJ Morris uh, at, at quarterback coming over from NC State, right? played in four games last year when Brendan Armstrong wasn't getting the job done, then said, you know what? I've kind of proven what I want to do. I'm going to take my red shirt. I'm not going to play anymore. Transfers up to college park. And now he is the face of this Maryland offense. The defense is going to be really fun. They've got uh, Roman Hemby running the ball, some fun weapons, maybe some unproven weapons, but some fun we- weapons nonetheless outside. And guys, I don't think this schedule is all that tough. UConn, Michigan State at Virginia, Villanova at Indiana are the five first five games. There's a real good shot that Maryland is 5-0 and oh, heading into their first bye week. Uh, they've got Northwestern, USC at Minnesota, and then it gets tough down the stretch at Oregon, Rutgers, Iowa, and, and at Penn State. So I'm not taking Maryland to win the conference or go to the playoff or anything like that, but you're giving me six and a half? As the over-under, I think Maryland can easily get to eight wins this season, and if something special happens, that's just the cherry on top. I I love the pick, and we talked about Mike Loxley on the Hot Seat Show. Um, I think it was a few weeks back, and I only mentioned his name just because I was wanting to get, you know, just a temperature check, right? And we we landed on absolutely not. He's not on the hot seat, and he's going to be someone that benefits the most from – realignment of the divisions and scrapping of divisions in the big 10, because they no longer have to play Penn state, Ohio state, Michigan, and maybe a Michigan state that's good certain years or a Rutgers that's good certain years. They don't have to play in arguably one of the toughest divisions in college football every single year anymore. It's going to be huge for Maryland as they get to diversify that schedule a little bit. It starts this year. And I think, yeah, they've got the talent they've been building quietly recruiting monster there in that region. I think, I think it's it's hard to argue that anyone is better at recruiting than them in that particular region right now. So, yeah, why not Maryland to make a big step up this year? Yeah, I mean, obviously, it's pretty well documented in my history with Maryland from last year. And while I certainly don't feel scorned like I did from Louisville that one time, and you know, I don't want to don't want to talk about it too much, but I, I certainly don't have Louisville feelings towards Maryland. For me, it's definitely a prove it type of thing. I think for me, I, I have to look at it and say, okay, well, you know, last year there were a lot of winnable games on that schedule where you say like, Oh, Maryland's probably the better team. And if Talia does his thing, then whatever. And it didn't happen, right? It just, it didn't happen for him last year. They lost a bunch of games. I don't feel like they really had any business losing for me this year. It's going to have to be something about game day prep and just showing up to the games that they have to show up to. Right. It's, it seems to be, you know, something with Maryland. They just get snake bit at certain times. Now the schedule sets up real nice. Like, you know, you were talking obviously no Michigan, no Ohio State. Um, you know, you look at kind of what they have to deal with. Yes, they do have to go to Penn State at the end of the year. Yes, they do have to go to Odson, make that trip across the country. But outside of that, it's pretty favorable. They get to play USC at home. Um, and so, you know, it, it's probably going to end up being a, a more favorable schedule and hopefully better results for Maryland. The the hope for me, if you're if you're looking to hit this over with Maryland, is with that soft open. Right. I think yes. you got a real chance to build some momentum at the beginning of that schedule and yep. make it UConn, Michigan State, Virginia, Villanova, Indiana, a bye week, Northwestern. You could be, you know, it's feasible to say you could be six and oh, bowl eligible and, you know, probably ranked pretty good when you go play USC. So maybe we're not even really looking at that game as an upset when the time comes because we're looking at Maryland saying, hey, you're a pretty dang good team there, Terps. And so, you know, I, I think that. 
you know, with ultimately with Maryland, yes, the quarterback transfer, you're going to have to figure out if he can raise his play to a consistent level that we just didn't see out of Talia. He had some real bright flashes, but just didn't always show up the way you wanted him to. Made some pretty dumb decisions with the football at times. Um, but, you know, I do like him be coming back as the running back. He's he's a thousand yard rusher a couple years ago. Didn't look at his numbers from this year, but um really solid running back and can certainly get it done. Good blend of power and speed. So, um, you know, if they can kind of lean on the run game, maybe get some good, you know, consistency out of the quarterback spot, they should be able to score enough points to win a bunch of these games. They need to win in October. And that's, I think what I'm most concerned about that they started five and zero last year and then lost four straight. Uh, like you mentioned, yeah. Garrett, Tungabaloa Tunga Bailoa just had a, has a bad habit of throwing, picks to the wrong team at the worst possible moment yeah. they lost by seven to michigan i mean they had the wolverines on the ropes late uh they just couldn't couldn't cash it in so you know yeah. uh maybe maybe a shame on me if uh loxley pulls the wool over my eyes again this season but boy with that schedule being as as soft as it is and i'm higher on virginia i'm higher on indiana than most although you know we might talk about the hoosiers a little bit later on in this show but uh yeah maryland should win those games rather comfortably yeah totally agree and look out for their defense as well we yes we really know them for their offense but the front seven could be really scary this year yeah uh well garrett let's go to your first team it's talking about defenses that are much improved a front seven that is quietly very scary under the radar smu has had a pipeline from coral gables to the metroplex they've been, just been taking on hurricanes left, right, and center. And Rhett Lashley really has built up a nice team ahead of their first year in the ACC. Yeah, man. Lashley is doing a great job over there. My, my first, obviously, darling, SMU Mustangs love what they're doing and love ultimately what they've been able to accomplish in the past going into this first season in the ACC. Um, I, I want to highlight a couple things from last year. Again, you said very improved defense. They finished with the 11th ranked scoring defense last year eighth ranked scoring offense. And this is not always just like, oh, bad teams or bad defenses, right? They're putting up points against some pretty good defenses in the American and, and holding down some really good teams and some really good quarterbacks there as well, holding some teams to some low numbers. So look, you know, the ACC, it's a big jump. A lot of people, I think, writing off SMU in their first year. I don't think that's entirely fair. I think when you look at this team, you bring back Preston Stone, obviously finished the year hurt last year, so really didn't get to see how they could finish the season with him. But he was, I mean, on fire and, you know, improving throughout the year. Um, and so I think him being able to come back and kind of run it back year two, Preston Stone time, right? It's, it's you know, officially his team with some experience. I think he's going to be able to really lead this team through their ACC schedule. And they bring back virtually everybody that they need on the offensive side of the football, right? They, they bring back all their role players, all, all the the running backs, the receivers, the the tight end, RJ Maryland, one of my favorite tight ends in the whole country. Um, just love what he's doing. Uh, touchdown machine over there. And, and the defense, yeah, you're right, it's much improved. The secondary is almost entirely intact. Brought in a couple transfers to shore up some of those spots as well. Really yep. shouldn't let a bunch through the air. Front seven, maybe a little bit underrated. Uh, I think they're going to do pretty good with the pass rush. Um, and so, you know, you look at that, you combine all of that with their schedule in the ACC and, you know, talk about really gaining some momentum. They have the ability to do that going into a game in the end of September. So you go at Nevada, uh, it's HCU Huskies, BYU, TCU, and then you play Florida State at home. And Florida State at home is going to be a big weather stick for this team to kind of see how they can stack up and if they can just avoid getting punched in the face and, you know, losing by 50 or something like that, right? If they can keep this thing close, we put this on spoiler watch, right? This team can score in a hurry, make a statement against Florida State. Not going to pick them to win that game right now, but definitely put it on spoiler watch. And then you kind of end the season a little bit light. Louisville following that should be a really good team, so that should be tough. But then you look at what happens after the bye week. Stanford, Duke, that's a new Duke team, different head coach. Elko obviously leaving a and you play Pitt, you get another bye week, and then it's Boston College, Virginia, California. It can be a real nice close to your season with, you know, just a couple of early tests. And so I, I think that September stretch with TCU, Florida State, and Louisville uh, at the beginning of October should be kind of the tough stretch for them. Mm -hmm. but when you look at their number, it's just over seven and a half. Uh, I think you can easily say that they could finish this season six and oh. So then you just had to find me two wins against 
you know, some of the, the who cares at your beginning of your schedule. Maybe, you know, you score a bunch of points and surprise some people. I think SMU could be threatening for the conference by the end of the season and, and, you know, really putting some pressure on some ACC teams down the stretch. Might sneak up and surprise some people, but not going to surprise us, the season ticket holders over there in Dallas. So we're, we're going to have fun. We're going to ride the Pony Express, and I'm going to ride them to the over seven and a half. Man, we got in on that investment early, and it is paying off in oh, space. Yeah. The biggest thing to me about SMU when I think about their jump to a power conference is they have power five guys in the trenches on both sides. Yep. Of the that, that is a huge, huge bonus that I, I can't think of another team making the jump from G5 to power five or power four now that has had the talent that SMU has in the trenches. And that's what's going to cause them to keep up. I, I said this on the spoiler show. I know people will point to the Boston College Bowl game last year. That game was played in sloppy conditions with a backup quarterback. Don't use that to project forward. If you do, I think you're going to have a bad time betting on the ponies this year because you're going to be shortchanging them, shortchanging what they uh, can do. So, man, I, I'm really excited to watch them up close this year. I'm excited to figure out what games we're going to in person this year. Yep. And uh, you're absolutely right. They could be contending for the conference title by the end of the year. The, the one concern that I have is, and, and all of that is true, I just wrote SMU's preview um, for our ACC article today. I'm high on SMU. I'm, I'm bullish on calling them an ACC dark horse. I don't think nine wins is out of the realm of possibility for SMU this year. The concerning stat, though, is 0-3. That's what they were against Power 5 competition last year. They lost to Oklahoma. They lost to TCU. And... and Oklahoma was an ugly game. TCU got away from them. Uh, and then Boston College, obviously, uh, Trey, you mentioned it, in the Fenway Bowl, pouring rain, backup quarterback. Kevin Jennings was, was under center for them, although he did help win the ACC or AAC title over Tulane. Um, but they've just got to do it. And I think if they can start to warm up, uh, they get a you know maybe an easy, maybe one of the easiest Power 5 teams you could get in, in BYU in your third game. You're already going to be 2-0 and heading into that one a bye week in front of TCU. The byes really work out for SMU. They have yeah. three of them this season in front of the TCU game, uh, after the Louisville game, and before they go out uh, out to the farm to take on Stanford, and then again uh, before they host Boston College in that three-game uh, finale, Boston College, Virginia, Cal. So, yeah, I, I think nine wins is absolutely on the table here. I think – I, I think a seven and five season kind of seems like the floor. So if you're telling me the over unders just a tick above that, Garrett, I think it's a smart investment. Yeah, my uh, ponies this year. It's going to be a lot of fun. Sorry, Garrett. My uh, model that we've kind of teased a little bit, just looking at the SP plus and comparing teams and trying to factor in home field advantage. It doesn't. There's not a single game on their schedule that doesn't give the Mustangs a chance to win at the very mm-hmm. least. Yeah. It says that even in the ones that's projecting them to lose and not be a favorite, it's a one possession game. Right. Well, and even wow. like kind of what we said on the spoiler show, Trey, like we talked about that Florida State game. Florida State's going to be breaking in a lot of new players, and there could still be a little bit of rust to shake off there at the end of September, right? Like, you know, game four, game five is not typically where you're playing your sharpest football. Now, they're a well coached team, and so, you know, it's going to be fine, but we've seen DJU disappear in games. Uh, it's it's not uncommon for that to happen. And we don't know what's going to help on the other side. And, and again, Florida State's probably going to be a very good team. I, you know, gun to my head, I'd probably pick them to win the ACC this year. But, you know, just right now where we sit, SMU, they can score points quick. And so, you know, this is one of those you show up to Dallas, it's maybe a little bit of a sleepier day and you're not quite thinking too much about the ponies. And then they jump up on you and they score 14 real quick. Like this could be a problem for Florida State. You don't want to play them behind. So, you know, again, like not picking them to win that game, but this is a much better team than I think a lot of people realize. And if you're not taking SMU seriously, again, like I think it'll be to your downfall because it's they're the team that, you know, if you think that they're just the little like, oh, you were just the G5 team last year and now you're making the jump. Good for you, little guy. Like if you're thinking that about SMU, there's going to be some teams that drop games that they probably shouldn't on the schedule. 100 100%. 
Troy, let's get to your first darling of the season. We've got a Big Ten team. We've got an ACC team. Take us to Big 12 country with a team that just unveiled maybe my favorite helmet in the entire college football ranks. Yeah, it was pretty sweet. Um, I'm going to go with maybe the surprise team in all of college football last year, the Arizona Wildcats. They surprised everybody, won 10 games a year ago, lost their head coach, Jed Fish, and I think that has people sleeping on what they can accomplish in year one in the Big 12. They replaced him with uh, Brett Brennan, and I remember at the time I wasn't really super hyped about that hire, but it's growing on me a little bit. I, I think that it can be a really good, successful hire for Arizona. And it can start this year with the talent that they're bringing back. They're bringing back Noah Fafita. They're bringing back um, his number one weapon in uh, – um, help me out, Petro guys. McMillan. Yes, thank you, McMillan. Yeah, the, I should know one of the best wide receivers in all of college football. But That's right. It, it's a tough name. Yeah. It, it's, <laughs> anyways, not only that, they're bringing back four of the five offensive line starters from last year in a unit that was really, really improved and kind of spearheaded that offensive resurgence. And, guys, the defense really came on down the stretch last year, held Utah to 18 points, held um, a couple other teams in the Pac-12 under 20 last year a really solid squad that a lot of people thought was going to get ripped apart in the portal. They really didn't lose a ton of guys in the portal. They lost some, they lost some, especially on the defensive side of the ball, but a lot of their team, especially on the offensive side is still together. And I think that can be enough to rip off a lot of wins on this big 12 schedule. Big 12 schedule makers did them quite a few favors as well, especially on the back half of their schedule, because they play at Kansas state and Utah sandwiched around a bye that's a tough tough two game stretch no doubt about it after september though you turn the calendar to october they've got a home game against texas tech a road trip to byu colorado and west virginia at home at ucf houston at home at tcu arizona state at home i think that's where they really start to stack up a bunch of wins kind of similar to last year's season where they started a little bit slow but found their footing once fafita took over and the rest was history on the way to 10 wins um, and an Alamo Bowl victory. So, you know, beat, win your gimmies, beat New Mexico, beat Northern Arizona, maybe take your lumps in Manhattan and Salt Lake City. I'm not going to predict a win in either of those situations there. But then just see what happens. You just need five wins out of the last eight games, and I think those are all very, very winnable for this Arizona team, especially those home games. Uh, for me, Arizona is interesting because I think the coaching is going to be what I'm most interested to see, right? Because obviously, like Fish leaving, so you're, you know, new coach. That is what it is. I'm not going to doubt the staff. What I'm going to question is what happens when you start October, right? When you start October, let's let's go through the simulation for a second. You lose two road games to Kansas State and Utah. They could certainly win either one of those games. They're good enough to do it. But let's just project it out and say they're two and two. Well, if you're two and two. And your staff isn't ready to kind of, you know, hey, let's, you know, keep the heads up, whatever else. This team having experienced a lot of success last year could be a little bit down on themselves, right? And and this is a team that, you know, again, they had a year of success. Let's see what they are. There's going to be a lot of people saying, like, is it a fluke? Is it going to be new now that they're in the Big 12? And you really got to make sure you can focus, you know, you know, keep it in the locker room. Right now, I'm, I'm not saying that they can't do that. I'm not saying they're going to be, like, mentally weak. But for me, it's going to be, how do you respond? Like, do you go out against Texas Tech, a team you should probably beat at home, and do you kind of, like, mess around and, like, win a game by three? Or do you go out there and you beat them by 20 and you show, like, no, 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 we're still Arizona, we can still do this. We just played two of the better teams in the conference, like, back-to-back, -back, right? Is it more of that? Or, again, like, are you going to kind of follow up? The good news, though, like you were saying, Trey, like, there's a real easy stretch in there. BYU, Colorado, like, that's some time to kind of, you know, stock up the wins and, you know, hopefully you go, you know, play West Virginia at home. That could be a, you know, easier one at home. Certainly better than playing on the road um, at UCF. Doesn't really scare me. So could be a good lineup for the schedule here. Certainly a lot of the offensive talented pieces are still in place. Again, you're just kind of hoping that the the scheme and the and the brains behind the operation, right, from the coaching side, you're hoping that's still fine. Uh, one guy that they got out of the portal uh, a late ad was Jacory Krosky Merritt, who was the leading rusher for New Mexico last year. He committed to Ole Miss and then backed off that commitment just a couple of weeks ago to head out west to Tucson. 
Um, yeah, Brett Brendan's not a, a flashy pick, but he was able to keep Trey, like you said, most of the core together. They had a top 20 scoring offense. They got Fafita McMillan to stay home, as did most of that offensive line. The defense, a lot of the defense left 28 players total out in the portal, but they also brought in a lot of talent. Uh, with that coaching change. So the defense is a little bit of a, a question mark for me, but the offense being able to to pretty much pick up and go, and if not be better this year with Merritt at, uh, at tailback as well, I, I like this pick. I think Arizona certainly has the the engine to get to eight or nine wins, which you know the over-under only being at seven and a half, that's obviously the, the highest end of the over-under that we pick in our darlings, but uh, I think eight, nine wins, and and you know maybe they get an upset at Kansas State. Kansas State will be coming back from New Orleans, where they'll have played Tulane in week two. So maybe you catch the little apple, you know, either uh, asleep after a win over Tulane or second guessing themselves if the Green Wave can pull that upset off. So I think there's a, a lot of potential for Arizona this year, and man, those uniforms are really good too. So easy to root for the Wildcats. Yeah, and you know, you talk about losing a lot on defense. They did bring back their top three tacklers, I think like five of their top six from last year. So lost a lot of players, but yeah, keeping the core, like you said, and that that was key to to just keep the band together, keep it rolling down the road. Yeah, absolutely. Arizona's gonna be a fun team to watch this season. They're gonna be a sexy team to watch this season. My next darling. I don't know that they do much that's sexy. They they win a lot of low scoring games, a lot of ugly games. Uh, guys, I'm jumping on the bandwagon of Iowa State now. Famously Welcome, last year, Welcome. yep, I, last year I could not have been more distant from the bandwagon. I, I had left that in in the ditch uh, of the sports betting scandal. They didn't have a quarterback. We didn't know who was going to be eligible the rest of the season. But from those ashes emerged Rocco Beck. Uh, who won freshman of the year in the Big 12, had a very solid season at quarterback for the Clones. And guys, let me tell you this. Seven and five is their over-under right now. Their schedule is not that hard, all things given, uh, all things being equal. They do have to go to West Virginia and to Kansas, who will play a fake home game in Arrowhead. And then they play Utah and Kansas State, at the end. Now you may look at that schedule and go, okay, that's four losses. So aren't you cutting it a little close? Well, maybe, but Iowa state returns almost everybody. I can't wait to break them down really in depth in our big 12 preview, because they're going to be a fun squad. If Matt Campbell can't win with this team, I don't think he's ever going to be able to win anything of note uh, in Ames. guys. I think this is the year in my father-in-law, my, my in-laws are going to hate this. They're big, big Hawk fans. I think Iowa State pulls it off this year and beats Iowa in Kinnick Stadium. Um, wow. That's going to be a tremendous uh, tremendous breakdown in week two. I'm, I'm sure I'm going to catch all kinds of hell for that. In a row, right? Didn't they win the last time it was at Kinnick? It was like a uh, really crappy game. That I don't remember. That sounds right. They've won recently. Um, couldn't tell you if that was two years ago or if it was a little bit further back, but – I've got this feeling that Iowa State goes into Kinnick and is able to pull that one off. Um, so I've got Iowa State getting to nine nine wins this uh, season. I, I think they have a chance to go to Arlington if if some chaos breaks breaks loose in the round robin that is the Big Twelve. Um, but I think Iowa State's going to be a special team. Their offense certainly has the pieces to succeed, and like I said, everybody's back on that defense. Uh, I'm really excited about the Clones. They did win in 2022, 10 to seven at That's Kinnick right. Stadium. So a real barn burner um, yeah. in that one. Man, I mean, join the club. I, I I was high on the Cyclones at just making a bowl game last year. I I, I toot my own horn until I remind everybody. I was just I was just thinking they could maybe slip into a bowl game, but that they're ready to take the next step. I joke all the time on this show about how there's ten teams that could win the Big Twelve this year. Iowa State's much closer to the top of that list than they are the bottom of that list because yep. they have an engine, they have a plan that works on offense, and they have guys that play with their hair on fire on defense every single year. And that's a winning recipe for to win a lot of games in a conference like the Big 12. I'm excited to see you know, what they can do. Abu Sama is 
Yep. A huge breakout candidate. I took him in our fantasy draft a couple weeks ago in one of the late rounds. Go watch him against Kansas State last year in Farmageddon in that snowball. He put on a show in that game. They're going to have a lot of fun pieces on offense and a lot of guys that just play really hard on defense and don't let you score a lot of points. Yep. Uh, I will say there is one game I think you got to circle that puts your uh, seven and a half in question here, and that would be their trip to Morgantown. I, the trip to Morgantown is not going to be a fun one. Um, one does not simply walk into <laughs> – West Virginia and win that game. So I, I do think that's the extra one you got to maybe keep an eye on. But outside of that, yeah, you got the other four. And and I'm certainly not going to pick them to go oh and five in those games. I think it's definitely a candidate to hit their over. And yeah, they're probably in that group of, you know, the entire Big 12 minus maybe two or three teams that could end up feasibly winning the conference because there's not necessarily the clear team at the top right now. And so like, yeah, I think this is a it's a great pick. Um, I, I don't think that they're the exciting or sexy pick necessarily, right? Nobody's going to get real excited over, you know, just good defense and, you know, winning games the discipline way. But, you know, this, there have been teams that have done that and had a good time. And so, you know, I think, you know, I, I, I don't necessarily love the pick to beat Iowa. Um, I, I wouldn't necessarily pick them in that game right now, but I think they'll grab a couple of those down the stretch. And, you know, I think that Kansas State game at the end of the year could be a real fun one too. So I'd, I like the pick. It's a lot of fun. They won Farmageddon on the road last year. Maybe they can pull it off again at home against Kansas State. We'll see. Uh, but let's stay in the heartland, Garrett. And uh, I'm surprised to see this one on, on your run sheet. Last time I checked, Trey was the one pushing old big red to the playoff. You've one. got, you've got Nebraska at seven and a half as your second, darling. Now, I did say this ahead of the show. If it wasn't for the fact that I was defending these guys so just passionately in the comment section of our YouTube videos, I probably don't pick Nebraska here for my darling. But, you know, I've, I've kind of been through the fire with those guys the last couple of weeks, you know, trying to defend them and all the haters saying they can't do anything. And so I'm, I'm going to defend them once again with some of the reasons I've been pulling in the comment section. We're taking Nebraska over the seven and a half. My spicy take is I think Nebraska has a real chance to make the playoff this year. I think they have a real chance to go, you know, 10 and two, maybe grab one of those last playoff spots out of the big 10. They, they could certainly do that. So here's kind of my, my logic and reasoning. Number one, anytime Matt rule coaches a team, the first year typically goes terribly. And then the second year, there's a big jump. Well, the first year didn't really go terribly for Nebraska, right? You go, Five and seven, don't quite make a bowl game. Uh, <laughs> kind of agonizingly don't make a bowl game. If you ask some Nebraska fans, there were some real opportunities you probably should have had. But they came out there, they had the 13th ranked scoring defense all year last year. That's a really solid defensive effort. And they bring seven starters back. And so this is a team that I think can still put up a really solid defensive effort. Now the question is, what are they going to do on offense? I understand if you don't trust an 18-year-old to run your offense. I get it. But Dylan Rail is a very talented 18-year-old, and he can really sling the ball all over the yard. And when you look at what they had passing last year, it's not going to be difficult to just make marginal improvements, even if he only has kind of an average season. Your leading passer last year had 967 yards passing, seven touchdowns, seven interceptions, and completed 49% of his passes. This is not what we would consider good, right? This isn't something we would typically say is good, uh, out of a quarterback. And and so, you know, even if he just comes in there, passes for, you know, 2,000 yards, throws 20 touchdowns, right? Nothing necessarily flashy. You're talking about a massive spike in output from that quarterback spot. In addition to that, you bring back your running back. You bring back four out of the five starters in the offensive line, and it's a beefy offensive line, too. I think the lightest guy on that offensive line is 305. So you got some real size and some really big, you know, big 10 offensive linemen up there. This could be a really solid Nebraska team, and it's not hard to see why when you look at the schedule as well. We've talked about the schedule a couple times, but I'll break it down one more time. UTEP, Colorado, Northern Iowa, Illinois, Purdue, and Rutgers is how you start your season. There's not really a reason to drop more than one of those games. You know, Rutgers is pretty solid. They're probably, they'll probably beat Rutgers at home. You get a bye week. You go to Indiana. You go to Columbus to play the Buckeyes. You might be undefeated in that game, and you could be seeing college game day with a couple of undefeated teams there in Columbus. You play UCLA, you play USC, uh, you get Wisconsin and Iowa to finish the year. 
there's not a lot of games I think they can't win on that schedule. I think Ohio State would be a stretch on the road. I think you'd have to have some real things go your way if you're a Nebraska fan. Um, at USC could be tricky. They could still put up points, but I don't trust that defense at all yet. We'll, we'll see what that defense turns into. And then you go Wisconsin and Iowa, a couple of teams that could be good, but definitely have some flaws. I think this is a really good Nebraska team. I think 10 and two is definitely on the table for this squad this year. And I think you could be talking about Rayola as a real breakout star in the college football world as a freshman. So give me the corn Huskers. Let me, let me back these guys up right here. And, and, you know, Trey, I'm sorry to have taken them from you. I guess, you know, we could maybe kind of share them, you know, kind of, we can both walk them across the line or something like that, but give me Nebraska, man. I'm eating the corn. Yeah, I, I forgive you because it's a great pick. And <laughs> Matt Rule is going to do what Matt Rule does. I think yeah. he can have a team that makes a big jump from year one to year two and maybe a year ahead of schedule from what he's done in the past at Simple and Baylor. So, yeah, you, you combine that. You, you highlighted all the great reasons why you should be in on Nebraska this year. The schedule is not that difficult outside of a couple of games. I'm really not high on some of their like mid tier opponents this year, like USC and UCLA. Yep. And th they were right there last year. How many one possession and like three points or less games did they lose last year? A, a ton. So at some point, luck has to flip around for Nebraska, right? I know they've been saying that for a decade in Lincoln, but at some point, the luck factor has to just completely flip. And when it does, Watch out because Nebraska might win 10 or 11 games. They're about as due as a team could be, probably. Yeah. Well, and it, it just comes down to not throwing an interception in the last two minutes. Like, how many times did we watch Jeff Sims or Chubba Purdy just throw an objectively terrible interception to nobody in particular driving within the last two minutes of the game? It, it happened at least three times down the stretch last year. So if, if they're just able to take care of the football, they they nearly got to a bowl game, could have had seven, eight wins without a real offense. So if Rayola can just be marginally better and not turning the football over, boy, Nebraska's got a, a I, real chance to be special. I did a little bit of quick math to kind of further highlight that. If you combine all of their quarterbacks from last year, they threw for a combined 1,500 yards, yes. 10 touchdowns, and 16 interceptions. And they were Dylan Rayola will spike that. That's going to be way, way, way better this year under Rayola. They were one in five in one possession games last year. Yeah. And four of those games were decided by less than a touchdown. Yikes. <laughs> I, uh, Nebraska's a sleeping luck, giant. Luck they can really do it. Luck has Listen, to. For, for Husker mental health, I hope it flips because if not, man, uh, yeah. Chat, chat support, mental health sessions on Tuesday nights are going to be are going to be chock full in the heartland. Uh, Trey, let's move on to your second one, and you have one of well, you really have two of the most interesting darlings that we all considered on this list. Left, we all support the troops. Um, Garrett and I don't didn't take it far enough to take them, you know, this team to go over their win total, but. Tell me why you're backing Troy Calhoun and his bunch over at the Air Force Academy, six and a half being their win total. Yeah, guys, do you know the last non-COVID year that Troy Calhoun and company failed to hit that number? His first year of, on the job? It was not his first year. I, I, uh, it wasn't that drastic, but they have been the hallmark of consistency in a conference that is characterized by chaos. It's been since... 2018 in a non-COVID year that they did not hit an over. They went five and seven back-to-back -back years in 2017 and 2018. Other okay. than that, they have hit it every single year since 2014. 10 wins in 2014, eight in 2015, 10 in 2016, 11 in 19, 10 in back-to-back -back years in 21 and 22, and nine in 2023. I know that includes bull okay. wins, but – they're just a hallmark of consistency. They lost a lot of players. They only bring back six total starters. I totally get that. But in a situation where they are bringing in guys, obviously the service academy, you're recruiting a little bit differently than you are at other places around the country. 
they're bringing in guys that are ready to run that system and ready to be really coachable in that system. And really their schedule isn't that daunting. Like six and I think for most teams, if you're looking at a team that's bringing back six starters total on offense and defense combined, most of those teams over under is going to be in the like three or four range, not the six and a half range. So I think the six and a half is already baked into how good of a coach uh, Troy Calhoun is, but looking at their schedule, Merrimack, San Jose state, both at home, San Jose state breaking in a new coach. They go to Baylor. That's the game I should have on upset watch because I, yeah. I, the bears, I, I think they're coming off a game against Utah, right? But yeah, they're playing at Utah the week before that. I, they're going to play at Colorado the week after air force. They are not going to be taking the Falcons very seriously like that. That's just, it's going to be difficult to get up for air force. Um, so that that's an interesting game. They tend to struggle at Wyoming. So I don't know about that one, but then you have to get up for Navy at home. And then after that, after the Navy game, you're at New Mexico, you got Colorado state at home at army, Fresno state, Oregon state at Nevada at San Diego state. So it's just a numbers game for me. Really? I, th I think they can find seven wins on that schedule and it's more just about gritting out a couple wins. I wanted to back up my take of taking their defense too. Um, they, they just always have an elite defense on the field. Part of it is because their offense sucks the time out of the game and doesn't give the other team a lot of chances to score, but they also are another team that just has a lot of guys that are playing sound football in their scheme, not making a lot of mistakes. And that's a recipe for a good defense. It says something to me that they're as consistent as they have been in a conference that literally every single year turns out a different team that we think should go 10 and 0, but they go three and nine, right? Boy, if that isn't the truth, Utah state and San Jose state uh, flip that order, but San Jose state, then Utah state won the conference in back-to-back -back years in, I believe it was 2020 and 2021. Both of those teams weren't even projected to make a bowl game. Yep. Yeah. And no. Air Love Force it. has just been a stalwart of consistency in that conference. And I just wanted to highlight that I think it's disrespectful to them to have their over under at six and a half. Listen, when Troy Calhoun is publicly on the record saying this will be the most challenging rebuild over one off season of my career, I'll give Vegas a little bit of credence because that's not that's not exactly bulletin board material for betters to go, you know what? Let me, let me back that. But you make a compelling case based on play style, the recruits that are always plentiful around the service Academy, specifically air force these last several years and Troy Calhoun's resume. Yeah. Yeah. It's hard be for me to disrespect air force over here. I'm not trying to be disrespectful, Trey. So sorry, please. Please give me some form of penance here. I'm not trying to. Not me that you got to apologize to. It's I, America. Oh, so. I got to. I got to drive up to the mountains and make my apology to that. Uh, to that. I mean, beautiful stadium right there too. But yeah, uh, great campus. No, great, great. Look, I think there's a good chance that this could hit. I mean, you are right. They're very consistent. There's not a whole lot of teams on this schedule that really say like, oh yeah, that's an automatic loss, right? There's not a whole lot of those on there where you're saying like, there's no chance they can win that game. That being said, there's not a whole lot of auto wins on that schedule either where I'm just saying like, oh, for sure, give me Air Force. That's definitely true. There's some bad teams on the schedule, so they'll they'll win some games against some bad teams. Might be tough to get to six and a half, but yeah, I think you're right. They can probably do it. There's, there's just there's too much variability right now with what could happen in their conference. So, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll take them to come up, you know, somewhere near the top with just, you know, good culture, good consistency. It, they'll find a way to win. They don't play UNLV. They don't play Hawaii, who a lot of people are picking to be spicy this year. Um, they don't play Boise State. I mean, yeah, the schedule is not terrible for them. So I like I like Air Force. I like the Falcons out west. I think you've I think you've won me over on that point. So I'll, on, I'll join forces join with the, you. Join the Air, uh, Armed Forces bandwagon, baby. Come on. That's right. Uh, Trey, I'm gonna flip it back around on you. Let's go snake style for this last all right trip through the darlings. Now, nine Windiana, I think we may have put to bed under the Tom Allen administration, at least uh, for those that aren't playing as the Hoosiers on College Football 25, because, boy, Indiana I don't think is going to be relevant for quite some time. But maybe Kurt Signetti can turn it around quicker than some would think. Trey, you are backing the Hoosiers 
over the five and a half win total. This might be the most audacious pick out of all of the darlings we've made. Please defend the Hoosiers. Kirk Sinetti's a dang good coach, man. And that entire staff that he's bringing over from James Madison just knows how to coach ball. And listen, this is not last year's Indiana team. They, they brought in no. 31. They're all tra- gone. They brought in 31 transfers, guys. They brought in they, – they're not going to return very many of their actual starters that were Hoosiers last year. Mm-mm. They're going to have 10 guys on the offensive side of the ball and all 11 projected starters were starters somewhere last year. So that says something to me. They're not just grabbing guys to grab guys. A lot of those guys did follow him from James Madison – and they're being transplanted now into the Big Ten. I'm not saying Indiana is going to make the playoff. I'm not saying they're going to win eight games, but I think that <laughs> Indiana will make, Indiana will make a bowl game this year. You can write that down. That is a take that I have. Obviously, I'm taking the over five and a half. Yep. Indiana will make a bowl game this year. Curtis Rourke, maybe the most underrated quarterback in the entire Big Ten that they picked up yep. out of the portal. I was shocked when he signed up to go to Indiana. I thought that he would latch on somewhere at an SEC school or somewhere that really needed a bigger profile team that really needed a quarterback. There were a lot of them, but he chose to go to Indiana to play for Kurt Signetti. And I think that says something about what he's going to accomplish bringing this group of transfers together. It's a ragtag bunch of misfits and ne'er-do-wells, but those guys are going to play hard for him. He's a great coach. And the schedule really isn't that difficult in the front half of the year. If they can start hot, they're gonna they're gonna go places this year. It has to get done early. I, I fully admit that because you know FIU yes. West, it has to get done early. <laughs> Very <is> early. <laughs> but I, I wrote in their team preview and I tried to paint I'm I'm high on Indiana being competent this year. I don't know that I can get them to a bowl game, but I am high on them being competent better than the end of the tom allen era there uh in in hoosier land but the back half of that schedule bro is nebraska is their homecoming game which what an unfortunate year for that to happen washington at michigan state maybe there's a win there in east lansing michigan ohio state at ohio state and then home against purdue the front half of that schedule, you have to go to UCLA and play Maryland at home. Um, yeah, I mean, if you're going to get it done, we we got to get going early. It's going to involve a couple upsets, but we build some momentum against FIU in Western Illinois. We go out to the West Coast. I think it's a winnable game at UCLA. I, I'm not super high on the Bruins this year. It's winnable. I, that does not mean they're going to win. But well, it, if you get to a bowl game, they have to win that, don't they? I think they do have to win. Yeah. It, there's there's a path without winning at UCLA. I think it's FIU, Western Illinois, Charlotte, upsetting Maryland at home. Oh, okay. Winning at Northwestern and then finding one more. That's five, right? That That's is five. five. And then finding one more between Washington at home at Michigan State and Purdue at home. If you don't beat UCLA. Obviously, if you beat UCLA, you're ahead of schedule. Yeah. yeah, if you go six and zero, oh, then you're you're your money. You're <laughs> money. over there. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, to me, I was looking at this saying you got to find six wins in the first four games, maybe minus UCLA. But I'm <laughs> I'm not gonna lie. You need I, to beat FIU bad enough that the NCAA counts it as two. There I, you go. It could happen. Maybe. What's the APR? Maybe they'll maybe they'll make it as a five and seventeen. That's <laughs> still they could, they right could. on the technicality. Look, I, right. did, I they, did they make the new Ivy League list? Did they did they get to be a public Ivy League like oh, I Texas know. and Maryland? Maryland does. Maryland okay. did. I don't know how that happened, but Maryland Good did. Curves, yeah. That's I, evidently, That's I didn't know enough about the college part of College Park. I've just heard about Bentleys. Yeah. <laughs> I personally have Indiana probably in the cellar this year when it comes to the Big Ten. I don't think they're going to win a whole lot of games. There's a lot of teams on there. There's a lot of teams on their schedule that I say – are problematic and won't be as good as we think they are, but I think they'll be better than Indiana. And I, I just don't really have Indiana winning a lot of games. There's a lot of games you could, you know, maybe squint your way to some dubs, but I mean, I don't even know that they can get past teams like Northwestern and, you know, what they did last year to kind of turn things around. 
Michigan State, I don't think is going to be that good, but they're going to be well coached. I like the coaching staff that came over. Um, Washington obviously lost a lot of pieces, but this is still probably a pretty good team. And so, you know, I'm just, I, I don't know. I, I like the gumption. I like the, the attempt to get them there. And, and, you know, I, I certainly am not going to, you know, knock you for saying that Indiana could win a bowl game, but I, I personally have whoa, 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 whoa. not win. Mate. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, yeah, make a bowl game. Whatever. Get a goodie win, bag. Sorry, win enough games to make it to the, I don't know what, pinstripe bowl or something like that. Something. That's that's right. Trey is just here for the gift cards to Outback Steakhouse and yeah, a happy yeah. Christmas with the family. That's that's nice. what he's here for. Uh, on a scale of one to five, how confident are you that Indiana can get to six and six? Three. Solid three. But I, I think <laughs> right. like, legitimately, like it depends on if the transfers hit. And it, they have, yeah, because that was kind of my other question. There's not too many years you say we got one returning starter in the 22, and we feel good about that. Well, but they have 10 guys on offense that started at an FBS school last year, and, yeah. 11 on it's, de- and all 11 on defense started at an FBS school. Okay, last year. yeah, it's Signetti's we gotta, guys, just a little bit on what we think about returning starters. I think, yeah, it's probably, fair. yeah. Yeah, I, and I yeah, think most the, of those guys are clear, especially the offensive skill positions are clear upgrades over what I, Indiana had last year. Uh, it it almost be hard to not be. Exactly. We're, so. we're gonna be <laughs> we're gonna be previewing Indiana. I think actually in our next episode because spoiler alert, uh, all of our conference previews are in reverse power rankings as decided by you, the listener. Um, so I believe I haven't seen the final results, uh, but I believe Indiana will be in that first episode. So the next time you hear us talking, we're probably going to be talking about Kurt Signetti. And I will take the lead and give you guys more confidence that they will. They shouldn't even be on this episode. They're going to be so much better than this. Hang the table. (laughs) I, I can't wait. All right, Garrett. Uh, so we go from maybe a seller dweller, maybe a bowl contender, but maybe a seller dweller to probably in my estimation, at least a conference champion, you were taking the Miami of Ohio Red Hawks over seven and a half. Yeah, man. And really this one is simple to me. Uh, what Chuck Martin's got is good enough to win the conference again. Um, again. And if you didn't watch that conference championship game, you missed out because it was entertaining and a lot of fun. And if you're like a couple of the people in our comment section who are talking about, it's not even important to watch like Mac football then get out of here with mm. that one. Mac football's fun, okay? Missing what else out. are you going to do on a Tuesday night in November? Exactly. How many other championship games are played at the Lions Stadium? Anyways, but so I love what they're bringing back. Obviously, you know, they get Brett Gabbard back, cut her uh, brother Blaine Gabbard. Um, he obviously, really good quarterback, kind of almost derailed their season with his injury last year, um, but they did rally around – uh, the team obviously, and you know, found a way to win on the ground. If he was able to be healthy, do you know where Avion Smith, the backup quarterback who saved their season, is at now? Because he transferred out. Uh, not a hundred percent. And I would also argue that the running back saved their season, but that's okay. Avion Smith transferred to Alabama A and M. Hey now, wow. hey, good for him. I mean, he he did play well in relief. He wasn't amazing, but he kept the bus going. Right? He, he yes, he was a bus. bus it was definitely a run team. And also just trying to emphasize this, but I think they had the eighth best scoring defense last year. Um, and so they, they, they play well on defense. They don't give up a lot of points. And there were some good offenses in the Mac last year, some very good quarterbacks that they really held down, including Daquan Finn in that championship game really yep. held him down. Didn't let them do a whole lot on offense. That was a low scoring championship game um, where ultimately they just kind of failed to, to convert there at the end. So look, you know, Is Miami, Ohio going to be the sexy pick on anybody's radar? No, certainly not. They don't win games big and sexy, right? But they win games. And this is a team that when you give me seven and a half as they're over under to a defending conference champion who a lot of that conference lost a bunch of pieces, right? A lot of the big time playing. Obviously, Daquan Finn transferred out. Just talked about Rourke transferring out. So there's a lot of big time players in that conference that are kind of stepping out. Meanwhile, Miami brings back a lot of their defense from last year. A bunch of the role players uh, on offense are going to be replacing the running backs. So, you know, that's going to be a little bit tricky to figure out. Uh, And they did lose one of their, I think, one of their, one of my favorite receivers on their team, uh, Gage Larvaday. And I think he went to South Carolina. But um, it'll be really fun to watch this team. Kind of a team that I, you know, sort of fell in love with last year, wrote their preview last year, and then got to kind of watch them flourish. I knew there was something in there. 
and it's got to kind of watch that team flourish and win a bunch of games. I, I think this could be another big season for Miami. There's not a whole lot on your schedule you're really afraid of. Put Cincinnati on upset alert one more time um, and, and win that game at home at Yeager Stadium. Um, you do go to Notre Dame. Not going to project a win in that game, obviously. <laughs> Um, and you do play at Northwestern. That's a pretty you know salty Northwestern team to start your season. So I'm not necessarily going to say they're going to start super fast, but you know you go UMass at Toledo, at Eastern Michigan, Ohio, Central Michigan, uh, at Ball State, Kent State, NIU, at Bowling Green. Yeah, give me give me eight wins minimum on that schedule. Uh, I think ten and two could be the ceiling here. Maybe eleven and one if they can sneak away with both of Northwestern and Cincinnati. But you know, give me a ten and two and a run through your conference one more time with some dominant defense. Give me Miami. Come on. I think uh, Bowling Green with Connor Bazelak coming back is probably their stiffest conference competition. Yeah, Ohio's yeah. not going to be the same. Toledo's not the same. Um, yeah, the, the directional and, and Michigan schools are not good. UMass, right? You gotta... Yeah, UMass I don't think is going to be very good this year. Either. Very good. I... They'll be in the conference, though. That That's going to happen. That's... That's true. That is that is a thing that is happening in 2025. I, I think the Red Hawks are – I think this is a great pick. I think this is a lock to go over unless they have a bunch of injuries. You know, Brett Gabbard right. has been has been hurt throughout his career. So, sure, sure. you know, maybe the injuries get back um, and catch up with the Red Hawks. But otherwise, I think this is a lock. All right, well, let's go from Red Hawks to Green Eagles. I'm taking the North Texas Mean Green as my final darling here of 2024. Their over-under is at 5 and a half guys there's a lot to like about north texas eric morris has put together one heck of a staff over there in denton um they had a top 10 offense in the entire country last year problem is everybody left chandler rogers who was seemingly ascending to the throne at north texas decided to go be a backup at cal rather than continue to put up 4,000 yard passing seasons so uh, North Texas literally is starting over on offense. Chandler Morris comes in from TCU uh, after losing the job to Josh Hoover in Fort Worth. The running back room has a chance to be scary. It depends if they're healthy. And then, really, they're going to have to figure out the rest. I really like the secondary that North Texas has. Uh, Ashim Young will probably be one of the leaders there. Ridge Tejada as well. Uh, Young comes over from Old Miss to play safety. So, North Texas is a team that I think is going to be, I think they're my little engine that could this year. Um, the schedule is not easy. Uh, you really have to squint to get to a bowl game, to be quite honest. But uh, I need a rooting interest that's local, and uh, I want to roll with with North Texas this year. So in order to get above the over-under of five and a half, we have to do the following. We have to beat South Alabama on the road in the season opener. It's not quite the same South Alabama team that we've grown accustomed to, especially not the one that beat Oklahoma State 33-7 in their own building last year, but not an easy game uh, at all. Texas Tech and Wyoming are on the schedule before you get to the bye week, and then you have FAU, Memphis, and Tulane in a three-pack after that bye week. Uh, two of them FAU, the say that again? Two of them are on the road, too. They're going and, to and, Boca Raton. And, and, yeah, e exactly. You got to go to Boca Raton. You got to play Memphis. Coming? They, they did. Uh, interesting okay. choice. You get another bye week. You play Army. So at least you get a bye week to prepare for the Knights attack. Um, and then you go to UTSA, home against East Carolina at Temple. Um, like I said, you got to squint. But there's a world where everything clicks and they go seven and five. There's a world where nothing works and they go three and nine. Um, I'm hoping that we're on the upper end of that spectrum and that North Texas can not only return to a bowl game, which they've grown accustomed to going to bowl games. I think last year was maybe one of the few seasons that they'd missed since the Seth Luttrell era started. Problem is they don't win them. Uh, I'm going to say let's worry about winning the bowl game later. Let's just make it to one this year. Show that that offense can really click no matter who's under center. And uh, let's have a let's have a fun season. I think they're going to be a fun team to watch. I'll say yeah, that. Mitch, I'm not going to lie. I was looking through the magazine to kind of pick out some of those transfers, see if I saw any names that you know caught my eye. And that running back, Zach Evans, I was about to freak out. Like, he ended up at UNT. And then I realized, Wrong obviously, one. 
Different Zach Evans. Different Zach. Also from Texas. Also, also from, from Texas. Texas. Uh, went up to Minnesota and then transferred down here. There you go. I just it, 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 the certain names do that to you, right? And I think Zach Evans in forty years, I'll see a kid named Zach Evans that goes into play at Tech or something, and it'll be like, wait a minute, he's still got eligibility. Yep. So just Zach like, Evans played in games for the Los Angeles Rams last year. He was on my fantasy waiver. I, wire. I'm aware of that. It just you know for <laughs> him, I it just never shocks me to see that he ended up somewhere else. I'm like, he's Wait. where now? Sure. So yeah, I I like again, I like the gumption, Mitch. I like the the effort to get him there. I think this is doable for sure. Um, but yeah, there's some real you know kind of testy spots there. Obviously Memphis, Tulane back to back. I think you can probably pencil in some losses for those, those are losses games. for sure. And, and do that for sure. Some bad blood with UTSA as well. So you know on the road, little hostile environment. They've they haven't always gotten along players. so good there. So it's it's you know it could be a little interesting there. But yeah, outside of that, there's not a whole lot. I mean Texas Tech obviously, but not a whole lot that really, really scares me on the schedule. So there there's a real way that they could hit and and make it to a bowl game and you know prove you're over. South Alabama, Stephen F. Austin, Tulsa in the first three. There's half of yeah, them. Yeah, they need those. Yeah. You have to pull off a win at FAU, which FAU is going to be improved. I don't know how much they're going right. to be improved from a three and, and nine on season the road, so. last year. It is on the road. I think they can beat FAU. Uh, there's four. And then East Carolina and Temple. Even if you lose to Army and UTSA, which they probably will. Um, East Carolina is going to have a really good defense this year. Offensively, I have no idea what to expect. Uh, Jake Garcia yeah. is probably going to be their quarterback, formerly of USC and Miami and Mizzou and now Greenville. Um, so, you know, who knows what, what Mike Houston's group can do this year. Temple is going to be downright awful. I don't care that it's on the road. They, they suck. So I can get them to six wins. You, I just, you know, need the boys to not lose heart as they're getting bludgeoned at Memphis and at UTSA, <laughs> which will be tough. Whew. Good luck. Uh, <laughs> that's all I really have to add. Chandler Morris might be a top three quarterback in the American. He could be. He could be. He, he's been good when he's been healthy. The problem is he just can't stay healthy. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. So anyway, we'll, we'll see what North Texas can do, but there's, there's my fun little rooting interest for this season. And that will wrap up our 2024 darlings episode we'd love to hear from you at three tech pod on instagram twitter youtube as well let us know who your 2024 season darlings are who did you like that we picked who did you hate that we picked we'd love to start the conversation with you follow our Substack as well just search three tech pod and Substack. put it in your search engine and subscribe for free articles podcast videos directly to your inbox next time we talk to you we're previewing the Big Ten in reverse power ranks order. We can't wait to kick it off. Preview season is here. Talking season has begun. For Trey Reeves and Garrett Turney, I'm Mitch Mason. Thanks so much for hanging out with us. Until next time, so long, everybody. Gracious, yeah. how about that?